Grace and peace be unto you, children of God, from our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank our God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus the Christ that in everything, everything, children, you're enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge as the world transforms you, not the world, but the word of God transforms you so that you won't be lacking in any gift. As you wait upon the Lord and his second coming, and the coming of Jesus Christ in the rapture. My friends, welcome to the Master's Touch Masterclass. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. <clears throat> now these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God, and I'm going to take you from the beginning to our eternal beginning in depth in God's Word, revealing His plan and purpose for your life, how He mapped it out, why He designed it that way, and into who you are in Christ, what power you have, why you have it, and how to operate in it as God designed for you to. You won't want to miss any of these classes. However, if you can't make it to the virtual classroom, then know that these are archived in Spreaker.com and on the website www.themasterstouch.org. And that's there for your convenience. I've also put it on the, if you go onto the website, themasterstouch.org, and you, you'll see it on the, I think it's on the front page that they're there. If not, you'll go into the, the audio uh, resources and you'll find them in there. And go into the master's blog and you'll find them in the blog as well. Now, God bless you richly as we begin today's lesson. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. It's just flowing through our lips, Lord. We exalt and praise you and your holy name. And Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and Savior, your only Son, Jesus Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation, knowledge, our rhema word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word in the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now today, we'll begin moving forward, keeping our last few lessons on the blessing in our mind. And we're moving now into grace. If you're born again believer... You're the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And um, you're not just the righteousness of God through him, but you're also the righteousness of God in him. All right? Righteousness, my friends, is a gift, and it's not a reward for perfect obedience to the law. As a born-again believer, you're clothed today not in your own righteousness, which is self-righteousness, but with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God sees you as righteous as Jesus is himself. Now, only the finished work of Jesus can bring us wholeness, completeness, and shalom, which is perfect peace. Some say that the Christian life is hard, and I disagree. It isn't hard. It's actually virtually impossible. Why do I say that? Because the only one who can truly live it is Jesus himself. Now, understand this. He wants to do it in us today. That's why it isn't up to us employing our own efforts to fulfill the law of Moses. Mm -mm. The law was fulfilled on our behalf, and the price for our sins has been paid in full on the cross. So what then? What, what's our part today? To believe in our Savior and receive him, and the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. All right? The Christian life is a life of rest in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, my friends. So it's time to rest from your own efforts and enjoy Jesus. Amen? Why does the devil hate the gospel of grace? I mean, really, why? Because it causes the believer to step into ruling and reigning here on earth. And when you're reigning, the devil doesn't reign. He simply can't. What do you feel like um, when you start to think about grace? I mean, what, what do you feel? Do you feel confusion? Do you become defensive? Now, you may hear people say, watch out. You have to be careful. Too many preachers say that we only need grace and that can't be good for you because it must be balanced with the law. Well, okay, let's look at Indiana Jones as our example. For Indy uh, can take a hold of any priceless relic, he must overcome the obstacles and traps surrounding the prized artifact. It, he can't get it if he doesn't overcome all those things. And what usually happens? Oh, fiery darts whiz by on his left. Poison arrows fly toward him from the right. Hidden pits filled with jagged spears lie in front of him. And giant boulders hurtle down on him from above. So what do you notice? Well, many, many obstacles have been erected to keep him at bay. Why? <laughs> well... Simply because there's a treasure at the end. Now, remember me telling you that the enemy wants to contain you? 
He builds invisible fences around the artifact, the item you're standing in faith for. Fiery darts, flaming arrows, pits filled with serpents are put in place to scare you away. The enemy has built these booby traps around the gospel of grace. He's well aware that the moment you learn to receive grace, you'll start to rule and reign here on the earth in this life. Now, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to see you broke and broken. He doesn't want you to, to see you ruling and reigning, so he has worked hard, extremely hard, to prevent believers from receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. How does he do his dirty work? Aha! Well, the devil's strategy is to surround the truths of God with controversies, to prevent God's people from benefiting from the fullness of God's promises. And what does he do? He erects controversies as invisible fences around these truths. The end result? Containment. Note this, you can always tell how powerful a truth is by the number of controversies the devil surrounds it with. I'll say it again, you can always tell how powerful a truth is by the number of controversies the devil surrounds it with. The Word of God reminds us not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. So pay attention, when Jesus died on the cross, the serpent's head was crushed. A great preacher once said, God gave the devil a PhD, permanent head damage. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Now, you'll always find that the devil's strategies are lacking in creativity. I mean, he's such an adult. What he has done in the past, he is still doing now. His game cha cha plan never changes, my friends. Never. It's the same over and over and over. What? How boring. He's an example of the enemy's work. Yeah, of his own. All right. But here, here, let me give you an example. And then I'm going to give you an example of God's work in restoring the truth to healing to the body of Christ. All right. For many years, the devil put up a sign that said heresy where faith healing was concerned. For just as many years, the church looked at that sign and backed off of healing. Their thoughts were, that's heresy, that's dangerous, and extremely controversial. So let's forget about talking about healing in the church. So instead of studying what the Word of God had to say about healing, and the, 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 the whole church backed away. It didn't matter that when Jesus walked on the earth, more than two-thirds of his ministry involved healing the sick. He went about healing the sick and all who were oppressed by the devil, and all who touched him were healed. Now, the Bible records it this way. The whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Luke 6, 19. Think about this. What if there was a movie that would record the scene that took place in Luke 6, 19? All who were sick, lame, and blind went to Jesus and bam! The healing virtue of Jesus was powerfully released as all who touched him were healed and restored. Apply that image to your imagination. That is a great and powerful image to keep in your mind whenever you're believing God for healing. Think about it. You have to know that the world doesn't have the truth. They package fiction and present it as truth. On the other hand, we believers have the truth, and you know what we do? We package and present the truth as if it was fiction. Come on, believers, we have the truth, so let's proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus with boldness. You see, only the truth of Jesus' grace and power has the anointing to liberate and set people free. Remember when God presented the truth of prosperity to the church? Signs went up saying, that's heresy. And for many, many years, the church backed away from and even mocked and chastised those preachers and teachers that were teaching prosperity. Oh, those prosperity preachers. You know, why? Because it was controversial. It didn't matter that the Bible declared that Jesus became poor on the cross so that through his poverty we might be prosperous. The church backed away saying, hey, let's forget about it, you know, those prosperity preachers. It's all too controversial. Now then, let me ask you, what do you hear in what I've just told you and see in the picture I've painted regarding the controversial issues that the church faced and still faces? Fear. That's what you should see, fear. Think about this. Why would believers fight for the right to be sick and poor? I mean, come on. As a parent, would you want your children to suffer under sickness and, disease, and be diseased? Or would you want them to be living in abject poverty? No, of course not. So tell me, why do we take our loved ones to the doctor when they're unwell? It's because we want them to be health, healthy and healed and blessed and have a prosperous future, isn't it? Do you think your Heavenly Father would want any less for you? I mean, that he would bless you with a meager hand when the streets of heaven are made of gold? Come on. They're not plated with gold. They're made of solid gold. So think about this for a minute. If you on earth know how to give good gifts to your children, your loved ones, how much more your Father in heaven? Matthew 10, 37 through 39. 
I want you to note something. The devil's been using controversy as a device down through church history to prevent believers from having access to the most powerful truths of God. He has built fences of controversy around healing, deliverance, prosperity, and grace to keep believers from ruling and reigning over sickness, poverty, and sin. Now, the more controversies you find around a truth of God, the more powerful that truth must be. Pay close attention to this. Not all controversies are based on the truth of God's Word. We have to test everything against what the Bible says. Nevertheless, controversy is a tool that the devil uses to prevent God's people from accessing his truths. The devil's a crafty liar and a deceitful thief, so we have to, be ba to base what we believe on the Word of God and test everything against the Scriptures. So don't back down from grace. <laughs> no, no, don't back down from grace. Just because you've heard that it's controversial, Bah humbug. Study the Word of God yourself and see what it has to say about grace. It'll open your eyes, it'll open your mind, it'll open your heart, and you're going to be blessed. What about the prosperity gospel preachers? Well, first of all, let me tell you this. There's no such thing as a prosperity gospel. There's only one gospel in the Bible, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, when you believe the gospel of Jesus, which is based entirely upon His grace, it will result in health and prosperity. In fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ leads us to blessings, success, healing, restoration, protection, financial breakthroughs, security, peace, wholeness, and much, much more. Now understand this. God blesses you not because of uh, your good, but because Jesus is good. All right? And he blesses us because he's good. Grace is based on his faithfulness and goodness toward you. It is not contingent on your performance, my friends, but is based on his undeserved favor. If it were contingent on how good you are, it would no longer be based on grace and would instead be based on the system of the law. It would be deserved favor, not unmerited favor, undeserved favor. And that's the difference between the old covenant of law and the new covenant of grace. Law is deserved favor. When you obey the commandments perfectly, you will be blessed. Grace is undeserved favor. Jesus obeyed God perfectly and you will be blessed by believing in him. So think about this. What covenant are you living under today? The old covenant of law or the new covenant of grace? You know, grace actually should not be a topic for Bible school curriculum. And why do I say that? Because grace is not a topic. Grace is the gospel. It is the good news. The word gospel simply means good news. Grace is not a theology. It is not a subject matter. It isn't a doctrine. It's a person. And that's the reason the Lord wants you to receive the abundance of grace. Because to have the abundance of grace is to have the abundance of Jesus Christ. Now, how can you say that grace is a person and that person is Jesus himself? Excellent question. What does the word of God say about it? John 1, cha uh, chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I want you to notice this. The law was given, but grace and truth came by Jesus the law was given, implying a sense of distance, but grace came. Grace came as a person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the personification of grace. Jesus is grace. It's important that you begin to realize that truth is on the side of grace and not on the side of the law. The Word of God declares that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Well, grace is that truth, the real deal, that's going to set you free, not the law of Moses. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments now. Now the law tells you, thou shalt not, and puts you under the bondage of having to perform perfectly in order to be victorious. The law is on the side of Moses, but grace and truth are on the same side as our Savior. You know, there's people today holding on to the law of Moses and preaching it as a, if it's the truth that liberates, but you know what, it isn't. Understand this, grace is the only truth that liberates. Truth is on the side of grace. We never hear, be careful of the Ten Commandments, or be careful of that preacher of the law. Why? Because there is no controversy about the Ten Commandments. Well, why isn't there? Because the devil doesn't want you to know that Jesus has liberated you from the law. If the enemy can keep you under the law, he can keep you defeated. What do I mean by that? Well, just simply this. You are not perfect and never will be. So if you're under the law, the law says you must do the law perfectly or you'll not be blessed. So where's your success there? You don't have any. You're defeated before you ever get started. And once again, there's an invisible shield thrown up by the devil to deceive you. Now, interestingly, though, people are afraid that when you tell a believer that he is completely forgiven uh, by grace and that he no longer has to try to earn his right standing before the Lord via the law of Moses, 
it would cause him to go out and live a life of sin and debauchery. However, the Bible is very clear that the strength of sin is the law. It's not, the gra not grace that gives people the strength to sin. It's the law. The more you're under the law, the more sin is strengthened. Conversely, the more you're under grace, the more sin will be depleted of its strength. In fact, the Bible declares that sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6, 14. This means that the more grace you receive, the more power you have to overcome sin. In other words, sin shall not have dominion over you when you receive the abundance of grace. <laughs> okay? Sin is strengthened when more law is preached, but the power to have dominion over sin is imparted when more grace is preached. So who is the one who switched the roles? Will the real gospel please stand up? The devil has pulled the wool over the eyes of God's sheep. And it's time to preach the truth. It's time to remove the wool from our eyes and break down those fences of containment surrounding the gospel of grace. The devil has also succeeded in erecting the containment fence around the gift of righteousness. Now today most churches are teaching the theology that not only is there such a thing as positional righteousness, there's also something known as practical righteousness. What they're saying is this, that even though you were made righteous by grace, you now have to do right and keep the law to continue being righteous. And they're calling this having practical righteousness. The Apostle Paul never taught anything like that, my friends. There's only one righteousness in Christ. That's in Christ Jesus. He's the righteousness. So let's see what the Apostle Paul says about those who are ignorant of this righteousness. He said, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, that's known as positional righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, and this is known as practical righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Romans 10.3 So it's clear that Paul is against any teaching that says you have to earn and merit your own righteousness. You are either righteous or you're not. There's no such thing as having uh, to have positional righteousness first and then having to maintain it through practical righteousness. You, the born-again believer, are the righteousness of God in Christ. Period. Okay. Note here that the strategy of the devil is to deceive the believer into believing that righteousness is something that you need to achieve by keeping the law perfectly. It all sounds very good to the flesh, but if that's so, then the promise of the gift of righteousness is completely thrown out the window. You see, the devil is very crafty. He has no problem with righteousness, but he wants to deceive you into pursuing your own righteousness through the law. He wants you to depend on your own self-righteousness. So he removes the word gift from the phrase gift of righteousness. Then he gives you a false impression that you're responsible for earning your own righteousness through your own works and self-efforts instead of depending on the finished work of Jesus. God's way is by grace, my friends, and no other way. Righteousness can't be earned by good works. It can only come as a gift. And, <coughs> excuse me, a gift is no longer a gift if you have to work for it. Isn't that right? All of your sins, past, present, and future, have been washed clean by the precious blood of, child, of, of Jesus Christ. You are completely forgiven, and from the moment you receive Jesus into your life, you will never be held liable for your sins ever again. You are not guilty. You have made, uh, been made as righteous as Jesus, not through your behavior, but by your faith in Jesus and his behavior, his finished work on the cross. There is nothing that you can do that will make God love you more, and there is nothing that you can do that will make him love you less. It was with the precious blood of Jesus that he purchased for you that gift of righteousness. He purchased you with his blood. You were bought for a price. Therefore, you can't earn righteousness. It's a gift from God through Jesus. So begin to see yourself clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Wait, Pastor Stephanie. If you're teaching that we don't have to keep doing the law to maintain our righteousness, aren't you giving people license to go out and sin? Oh, another excellent question. Let me begin by asking you this. Have you noticed that people are already sinning without a license? We all have the same goal of wanting people to live a life of victory over sin. Allow me to make this explicitly clear so that there is no doubt. I, Pastor Stephanie Engerbertson, am vehemently, completely, aggressively, and irrevocably against sin. Sin is evil. I do not condone sin. A lifestyle of sin leads only to defeat and destruction. So while our goal is the same, where we differ is how we get to the victorious life. 
Some say it's preaching more law. I'm convinced that it's by preaching the grace of God. Sin loses its appeal when you encounter the person of grace. Jesus Christ is the person of grace. He is grace. And realize then that all that he has blessed you with and all that do he's done for you on the cross is to make you righteous. I mean, unbelievable. You've been given this great gift of righteousness and that you did absolutely nothing to deserve it. Okay? You did nothing. Not one thing to earn it. And you did nothing to merit it. Let me ask you, does this encounter with Jesus cause you to want to go out and sin? Well, of course not. On the contrary, it'll cause you to try to fall, to, well, A, just fall in love with Jesus all over again, and it'll make you a better husband, a better father, a better wife, a better student. It'll make you someone who desires with all your heart to guard the glory of our God and, and, and our Lord Jesus by living a life that is victorious over sin. By his grace and strength. Because we won't be victorious over sin without his grace and strength. So the preoccupation with Christ instead of with self will cause you to start ruling and reigning in life through the one, Jesus Christ. The word of God says, awake to righteousness and sin not. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. The more you realize that you are righteous, the more victory you will experience over sin. Wake up every morning and give thanks that you are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> because of him... Through him, you have become the righteousness of God in him. God has been restoring his truth to the church. The last and final truth to be revealed in its glory is Jesus Christ and all that he accomplished on the cross. The revelation of the finished work of Jesus will get stronger and stronger and stronger in these end times. And it's then that mankind will begin to enjoy the ful and fulfill, not fulfill, you'll be able to enjoy the full benefits of the new covenant of grace that was given to us as a gift by Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't die on the cross for us because of one of us, any one of us deserved it. We all deserved hell's fire. But we have been redeemed by Jesus. So remember, the word redeem literally means to buy with a price. The price here is Jesus himself. He gave himself up as a ransom for you and me. He gave himself up so that you and I can receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, enabling us to rule and reign in this life, just as, as Adam and Eve were supposed to rule and reign. Jesus restored us to the, less, to the blessing, my friends. Mm -hmm, he did. He's restored us to it. Our power to prosper is it's given back to us and all of the supernatural things that we were gifted with here, right now. So you see, it's all about Jesus. It's time for the church to stop backing away from grace. Study the scriptures. Begin to see for yourself that this is the power of God unto salvation. Then run full bore with all the speed you can gather toward God and his grace, his unmerited favor. So how do we discern the gospel of grace? Well, let me teach you how to discern. If the grace, of, if the grace teaching you're hearing is doctrinally sound, this is what you, how, what you have to do. When you hear the new covenant of grace taught or preached, it will always exalt Christ. It always reveals more and more of Jesus. It always unveils the beauty of Jesus and the perfection of his finished work on the cross. There is no grace without Jesus. However, I caution you not to be too easily impressed. Just because a pastor tells you that he teaches grace, the word of God tells us to test everything according to the scriptures. So after all... God wants us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So even as you hear my words from the lessons that I teach, I tell you not to take my word for it. Look it up for yourself. Open up your Bibles and study the word of God for yourself to see the grace of our Lord Jesus in the new covenant coming alive. Grace is not a doctrine, my friends. Grace is a person, and his name is Jesus. Therefore, there is no grace teaching without Jesus. You can't separate Jesus and grace. If someone just keeps dropping the word grace into his sermons, but there's no exaltation of Jesus and his finished work, then it is not the gospel of grace, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, to further discern if, you, if what you're hearing is the gospel of grace, note this, that grace does not point to your efforts, your performance, or you, your doing anything. It makes nothing of the man's self-efforts and points completely to Jesus' efforts and what he has already done. The law makes one self-conscious. It always is asking, what must I do? But grace makes one Christ-conscious. It's always asking, what has Jesus done? Under law, the burden is on you to perform. Under grace, the burden is on what Jesus Christ performed on the cross. 
that's why Jesus said in Matthew 11:28, "Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." All right, the, lo the yoke of the law is hard and heavy, and Jesus came to reveal grace, and the yoke of grace is easy and light because, um, because of it. Um, and you know what? It involves none of you and all of Christ. He has borne the burden of sin on your behalf. Your part is only to believe on Jesus Christ, and when you believe, you are blessed and made righteous. Now, that's amazing grace. <laughs> the new covenant of grace is so powerful that there have been attempts to pervert the teaching on God's grace. There are some preaching at uh, a, a, um, a grace message that's not of God. They believe and teach universal salvation and claim that because of God's grace, all will be saved even without believing in Jesus. Now this is a lie directly from the pit of hell. No man can be saved except through the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father and receives eternal life except through Jesus. John 14, 6. There is no grace without the person of Jesus. The teaching of universal salvation is a lie that dishonors Jesus and negates his work on the cross. True, true grace always makes Jesus the center of, atten of everything, or attention, and sever the center of everything. It's all about him. So it's time for the church to exalt Jesus, to unveil more of his loveliness and more of his perfection and crazy, uh, it's gr uh, and his grace, because it's it's absolutely, it's not crazy, but I, it was a slip of the tongue, you know, euphemism. euphemism. Um, but it's mind-boggling, is what I'm trying to say. It's totally amazing, because it's all about bringing the amazing back to grace. Now, when believers don't understand that God's grace is undeserved, unearned, and unmerited favor, They'll depend on their own efforts to keep the law of Moses, to deserve, earn, and merit his favor. Similarly, when believers don't understand that righteousness is a gift, and that gift is about right standing and not doing right, uh, they will defend, and depend, I'm sorry, they'll depend on their own efforts to earn the gift. You are supposed and purposed to rule and reign in this life, right now. And we learn that from that, from that we learn that from the Genesis account. It's our Lord's good pleasure to see your marriages, our marriages, blessed, families blessed, uh, storehouses overflowing with more than enough, and our bodies full of the resurrection life of Jesus. So begin to look. See the devil, entrenched fences, and, and devil-built strongholds that are fortified as if they had thick walls. These walls surround the abundance of grace and um, the gift of righteousness, both. However, by the grace of God, we are pulling down these thick walls. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in, the, in God for pulling down strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10.4 Start receiving the treasures that were purchased for you by the blood of Jesus and begin now to rule and reign in every area of your life. Did you receive this today? Well, I pray that you did. And if you have questions you need further assistance with, uh, uh, just contact me, all right? <laughs> now, I want to remind you that you may tune in on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Pacific time for uh, continued classes, master's classes, right here on Spreaker.com. To contact us, the website is www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. Email us at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. Or poet at cox.net or mthsprayer at cox.net. Remember, Proverbs 4.7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Make sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. The Master's Touch Masterclass is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. God bless you. Thank you.